this story about a king that had a good friend. They grew up together. and They would go hunting together. And they would go out and uh, go out in the woods and they would hunt together. And the friend had a habit of no matter what happened, looking at everything from a positive uh, perspective. And he would say, that was good. This is good. No matter what happened, this is good. Well, one day they were out hunting, and the friend, what he would do, he'd go along and he would pre- prepare the, the guns for, this is back before the automatic guns and everything, he would prepare the guns for the uh, king, and he would hand the gun to the king, and the king would then shoot the gun, but that one particular day, he handed the gun to the king, and the king fired the gun, and it, and it misfired, and it blew the king's thumb off. And his friend assessed the situation and said, this is good, and... The king said, what? This isn't good. How can this be good? How can me blowing my thumb off be something good? And he got really mad at him, and, and he sent his friend to jail as, as the king. He could do that. Well, then about a year later, he was uh, the king was by himself. He was out hunting an area that he, he knew he shouldn't be in, but he was there hunting anyway. And all of a sudden, he was captured by a bunch of cannibals. And they took him to the village, and they uh, got prepared for their big feast. They took him, they bound him at the stake, started putting firewood around him. And when they were approaching to light the firewood, they looked up at his hands and noticed that he had a thumb missing. Well, being a superstitious superstitious bunch, they, they would never eat somebody that wasn't whole, that had something wrong with him. So they cut the king free and said, get out of here, we don't want you. And the king obliged and, and left. And as he was on his way back home, he was reflecting on it. Then all of a sudden, he he remembered his friend that was in jail. And he went to his friend, and he told him everything that had happened and said, you know, I'm sorry, but you know what? You were right. It was good that I had my thumb blowed off. And and then he told him what all had happened. And then he said, I'm so very sorry for sending you to jail. You've been here for a year. I'm so sorry for that. And his friend said, that's okay, this is good. And the man said, how in the world could me sending you to jail be good? And he said, well, if I wasn't in jail, I would have been with you when you found the cannibals in the woods. <laughs> well, that, that guy probably had an exceptional view of life and was able to take things well and But there have been times in life when all of us at one time or another have faced a situation that that took us unaware. It's amazing how songs will remind you of certain things. When Heather and Elisha were singing that song, I I couldn't help but remember the morning I was driving to church. I was at the stoplight over here at Terry and uh, Three Oaks. And that song came on and it just so happened to be the same week that Judy had found out that she was going to have to have uh, surgery, had found some polyps, and her mom had colon cancer, and her sister had colon cancer, and her, her brothers dealt with it a little bit. And all of a sudden, that fear set in. Wow, we've never dealt with anything like this before. Many times, those things come up, and thankfully, she did not have colon cancer, and the surgery went well. But so many times, things like that come up. You're you're living your life, you're going through, everything's going fine. Then all of a sudden, something blows up and your world is turned upside down. What do we do in those times? How do we handle that? How do we find God in the midst of darkness that surrounds us at times in life? Well, today, as we continue our journey through the book of Acts, we're going to look at a chapter, and we're going to look at a story. It's a very familiar story in Acts chapter 16, a story of Paul and Silas. They, uh, they end up in Philippi. Now, preceding that, because we're not looking at, at, verse, at chapter 15, but just so you keep along with the flow of the book, Paul and, Sil- or, uh, Paul and Barnabas had gone on a, a missionary journey, and they parted ways. And in chapter 15, Paul and Silas had been sent on their way because there had been an issue in the church. What do we do with all these Gentile Christians? They're not following all the Jewish laws. And the council at Jerusalem basically said, hey, we don't need to put any more burdens on them. Praise the Lord. They found the Lord. Just go on. And Paul and Silas were the deliverers of that message. 
Well, after they delivered that message, Paul and Silas continue to preach. And one day, Paul's planning on going one way to preach. And the Lord comes to him in a vision and said, come to Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is basically northern Greece. And he's in Asia Minor, which is just on the east of Greece. And he got on a boat, and they went over to Macedonia, and they ended up in Philippi. And that's where we're going to pick the story up in Acts chapter 16 today. In verse 12, we find this as it kind of sets the scene. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And there we stayed several days. Now, I believe Luke includes that note about Philippi because it's significant. First, this is the same church that Paul wrote a letter to later in his journeys. We have it as the book of Philippians. But what we also know about the Philippi is that it was a very special, it says here, it was a Roman colony. What did that mean? It was a special, exclusive city in the Roman Empire. Not every area that was conquered, not every city that was taken under the reign of Rome became a Roman colony. But Philippi was special. They adhered strictly to the Roman law. In fact, Philippi was kind of a retirement community for the retired military personnel of the Roman army. It was where they all retired to. It was a beautiful city. You you could almost say it was the Benita Springs of Greece, all right? And there you had a bunch of Roman officials, and that comes into play in what happens in Philippi. Verse 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. And the girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to become out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Now that's an interesting scene there. What the girl is saying is not bad. These men are the servants of the Most High God. And they're going to tell you the way to be saved. What could be wrong with that? Why in the world did Paul get to a point where he just turned around and said, Spirit, get out of this girl? Well, imagine this. Next Sunday you come in, and I've gone up to Fort Myers and found one of the local soothsayers or fortune tailors that has a shop set up up there. You know, the kind that you can go in with the crystal ball and the lights are down. And so I asked her to come and I, I set her up on stage here and, and she's got her crystal ball there and her Ouija board out and, and the candles burning. And, and every time I say something, she says, amen, preach on brother. And she totally agrees with everything I'm saying. What would you think about that? Something strange is going on here. Am I to take serious what he's saying or not? And that's kind of the scene I I see here. This girl was not doing Paul a favor. In fact, he was discrediting the message of Christ. Everybody in the city knew who she was. And Paul is trying to present the truth. And yet you had this soothsaying, fortune-telling lady following him around. And we don't know the tone in Scripture when you read it. But I, I just get the feeling that it was a very mocking tone. So he turns around and casts that spirit out of her. Well, verse 19, when the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Now, here's where the whole culture of Philippi comes in. Roman city, you got to keep the peace. Notice that they didn't say a word about Paul cast the demon out of our girl and we don't make any more money now. That was the real issue, wasn't it? Paul hit him where it hurt in the pocketbook. But what do they charge them with? They charge them with turning their city upside down and going against Rome. That was the one thing that Rome did not put up with. If you were a citizen in any of the cities that got overtaken by Rome, they would come in, they might take away some slaves, but then they would 
let you pretty much keep your culture, let you keep your religion, let you do all those things. But the two things you had to do, one, you had to pay taxes and never go against Roman law. If you did, and if the officials of the city allowed that to happen, and word got back to Rome that there was done rest in that city, then Rome would come in with a heavy hand and maybe do away with the officials. Who knows what they were going to do? So these men, they come and say, well, we know how to get a reaction out of people. We're going to say they've stirred up something against Rome. And look at the response of the crowd down to verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. This was not a good day for Paul and Silas. Like, uh, you know, they were stripped. They were beaten, they were flogged, which meant they were whipped with a a whip that had strips of leather that probably had pieces of metal and stone mixed in it. And they were beaten and stripped and flogged. And then they didn't just put them in any common cell. They took them to the innermost part of the the prison, probably the darkest spot. And then they put their feet in stocks. They could barely move. And there they were. Not sure what was going to happen. But then in verse 25, the story goes on. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And once, at once, the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison's doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. First, note what Paul and Silas were doing about midnight. About midnight, I'd want to sleep after a day like that. But they're up. And they're singing hymns and they're praising God in the middle of the night. The earthquake came. Must have been quite an earthquake. All the prisoners were set free. I don't know if the doors fell off. It implies the chains broke off the walls. It was obvious they could all escape. And the guard pulls out his sword and starts to kill himself. Why in the world would you do that? Well, because under Roman law, noted, they said when they gave it to him, he was to watch them carefully. Under Roman law, if you were a soldier and a prisoner escaped under your watch, guess what happened to you? You are killed. So here this guard All the prisoners have escaped. He knows it's not going to be a good day if he doesn't get these prisoners back. And he just says, I'm just going to end it now so I don't have to go on and face the death that's waiting me. But Paul, what did he do? Hey, hold on. Don't harm yourself. We are all still here. Verse 29. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that's an interesting question. But what we have to understand is that they have been hearing for we don't know how many hours singing and praising of God. It's not totally unlikely that the guard had maybe heard Paul and Silas preaching before they were arrested. And they had heard the message. There seems to be some connection there because when the jailer came to a point of crisis in his life, he turned to them and he asked them a question. What do I have to do to get out of this? To change my life? To take a new direction? And verse 31, they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household... Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. 
At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family were baptized, and the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. A lot of different perspectives, a lot of different angles you could take that story and a lot of different things you could look at. But I want to take it from this perspective. I, I, I want to look at the jailer's perspective. I want us to look at that story through the eyes of a jailer and what was going on in his life. He was just doing his job. He was just living his life the way he lived his life every day for we don't know how many years. He was a guard. At the jail. What does he do? He guards prisoners. I'm sure he woke up that morning and said, well, here's another day at, at work. And as he left the house, he kissed his wife and said, I'll, I'll be back you know, after my shift's over. And, and didn't expect anything to happen. Then all of a sudden, boom, his life was turned upside down. And in the darkness of a prison, he came to crisis. And didn't know what else to do except take his life. That's a pretty drastic change. I don't know if any of you here have experienced that type of thing. But my guess is all of us have experienced one point or another another, a time of darkness in our lives. Where something has happened, news has been received, and we just don't know what to do. We don't know where to turn. We don't know what the next hour, the next 10 minutes is going to bring. And I think it's important for us as as Christians to ask the question, what do I do when that happens? Where do I find God in the midst of my darkness? If you've never experienced a dark spot in your life, I wish I could say you never will. But chances are you will at one point or another. And I want us to look from what happened in this chapter to see how the jailer responded and what he did. And I think from some of those things, we can also receive some encouragement and some direction. Five things. The first is simply this. When that happens in your life, when you find yourself in a dark spot, be prepared to listen. Be prepared to listen. It was midnight. It was in the stillness of the night. Maybe you've been there before. You're wanting to go to sleep, but there's some noise that you can't put out of your mind. You can't shut it off. It's going to permeate the darkness. And for that night, it was the sounds of Paul and Silas. They were singing and praying praises to God. I'd like to know what songs they were singing or what prayers they were praying because it communicated the message that Jesus is my rock and my fortress and my salvation because the jailer responded to what he heard. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. And sometimes we just need to listen. We never know when or where or how God might speak to our hearts and our lives. He might speak into the situation that we find ourselves. For the jailer, it was through Paul and Silas that night. For you, it may be something totally different. It may be through a message. I don't know how many times I've had people come up to me and said, Boy, that, that sermon was preached for me today. Thank you for saying such and such and such. And I reflect back on my sermon. and I didn't say such and such and such. But God connected the dots where they needed to be connected. You never know where God is going to touch your heart or speak into your life. It may be through a message. It may be through a song. It may be through listening to the radio. It may be through reading a book. It may be through the words of a friend. But whatever it is, always in your life, especially in those dark spots in your life, be still and know that He is still God. And he will speak into your life if you're ready to listen to what he might be saying. The second thing that was so important is the jailer, he asked. Don't be afraid to ask. He said, after all this happened, he ran up to Paul and Silas, or he ran, yeah, and he said, Sirs, what must I do? And for him, it was salvation. He knew there had been something missing in his life because it says later on that, that he believed in God and 
he was willing to ask. Why is it so hard sometimes to to ask for help? Or to seek the questions that you're afraid of? You know, even as Christians, it's good for us not to be all afraid to ask for help. I've, I've had people here and in other churches that they've come to a point in their life when they're the ones that have always been doing for someone else. They're always the ones there to help at church. They're always there to do something that needed someone in the church. And, they, and, and when it comes to the point in their life where they need to receive there, it's so hard for them to ask. Let me just say, don't, don't rob the blessings Of someone else. When it's their time to serve. Don't be afraid to ask. It's all right. And the jailer that day. He went up and he he just. He just came right out. And said Paul and Silas. What is it. That I've got to do. He was about to take his life. But he asked the question. Don't be afraid to ask. For help. In your time of need. Third thing. Was a response. And his response was to believe. They replied. Paul and Silas. And he said. When he asked. What must I do? He said. Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus. And you will be saved. There might be a lot of things. That we might put our belief in. There might be a lot of things. That we, we think that. Well if I only. I, you know, I, I really believe this is going to do it, or I really believe that's going to do it. I really believe there's no greater thing to put your faith in and believe in than the words and the promises of Jesus Christ. And the jailer believed. And then the fourth thing he did, he obeyed. He obeyed. Because once Paul had shared this and he answered their question, the scriptures say he went on and he shared with them So they talked some more, and we don't know what all that conversation did. But at the hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately all he and his family, they were baptized in the Christ. That's what they needed. They knew that they had come to a turning point, and in the midst of the darkness, in the middle of the night, they said, it's God that we need. And they responded, and they obeyed. They were baptized into Christ. And you know the neat thing about it? It's the next time you look at the book of Philippians. Paul was writing to this jailer. And to his family. And the book of Philippians is probably the most intimate letter we have in the New Testament. And Paul in chapter 1 says, you know what? I've been praying for you. I've been praying continually for you. And I pray that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. And he shares with the jailer and his family in a letter later on, as well as the rest of the Christians who began to follow. Why? Because they simply obeyed. Now, Maybe you've already obeyed Christ. You've already been baptized. You've already been obedient in those type of things. But maybe it's something else in your life that that God is saying, you need to let go of this, or you need to, to apologize for that, or you just need to simply let go because you can't control the situation and, and take each step, one step at a time at a time. The Philippian jailer's response was to obey, and he obeyed and he changed his life. And what was the end of the result of that? He rejoiced. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. And I can't help but to think that his life was changed. Even though he had a very dark moment, he had a very scary time, he had a very certain, uncertain future at one spot in this story. In the end, he came to rejoice because of his belief in God. And that became more powerful than any obstacle he faced. I believe he began to see things in the perspective of eternity. I think that's key. Because there's things in this life that don't work out the way we would like to see them work out here on this earth. But when you look at them from a perspective of eternity and the promises of God, 
then all of a sudden, things look a lot different. I want to read some of the words of the song that Elisha and Heather saying, if you're like me, sometimes I hear those words in, in a song, and I don't really absorb, absorb the words. I just kind of listen to the music and things. Uh, listen, the, the words of this song are powerful. We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love, as if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while, you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd, we'd have faith to believe. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies? In disguise. When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. It's not our home. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know? You are near. What if? If that's what it takes to get us to eternity, then that's worth it. Then that's worth it. So let's be thankful. Even in the dark places in our life, that God's promises are still true. And pray that He will help us to listen and to ask, to believe and obey and rejoice in who He is and what He's promised for us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for this day that You've given us and I thank You for the blessings that we can find, Lord, even in the tough times of life. And Lord, I thank you for an eternal perspective that as we look at the things that happen here, we don't always understand them and they're painful and we don't know what to do. But Lord, let us be like the jailer who threw ourselves down and said, what must I do? Lord, help us this day to do that each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.